speakers in. We have a wide range of topics, so this is our pilot lecture to see how it goes today. So it's an introduction to cosmology. We won't go too deep, but we will touch on some interesting principles. So what's cosmology? Um, it's cosmos and ology. Ology meaning study of. Cosmos is an old Greek word for the universe, so it's a study of the universe. Now, what do we do within cosmology? Well, we try and answer some of the fundamental questions that we find we can't answer in modern day physics, such as maybe where did the universe come from? Where's the universe going to go? And what's happening in the meantime? A lot of what we will say today is explaining what happens. We can't always explain why or how that happens, but sometimes we can give it a good go. So we'll start by looking at the evolution of the universe. Um, famous quote from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it's big, really big. If you try and all close your eyes, note a bit preschool. But if you think of an explosion, but an explosion into nothing, that is what the Big Bang was. From a singularity, it expanded into everything we know today. Nothing could have existed outside it before we think. So, we think, although we're not entirely sure, that the universe began with what we call today the Big Bang. This is probably the most plausible theory, though there are others that you'll see in popular press and media, that will try and have a dig at it. We think it's safe, though, and we think it's sound. The Big Bang took place at a singularity. From this point, we had hyperinflation, which then led to what we have today. Now, at the very, very beginning of the Big Bang, it would have been immensely hot, immensely dense. And this is a question that we still don't really know the answer to. How did it inflate so, so quickly? And why do we get the CMBR radiation? That's the cosmic microwave background radiation. We see that, and that tells us what's happened in the past, and we use it for that. Maybe it was God that began the Big Bang. Again, we don't know. Some people's religion might fit in here. So we, there's a science of cosmology that will go along with philosophy. So God and the Big Bang, where do they both fit in together? There's another theory called the multiverse theory. This is where you get multiple universes, each bound specifically by membranes, called the membrane theory. And this means that we could have different universes that we can never get to, but simultaneous events may be happening in each one at the same time. Theories such as a choice in this universe will cause one to occur in this universe, but the opposite choice to occur in the other universe. And you see a lot of this in sci-fi. So let's have a look at a very quick timeline of the Big Bang, you can get some of the crucial moments that occurred straight after. We don't know how it began, but we can start at 10 times 10 to the minus 46 to minus 34 of a second. Now obviously that's an incredibly small number. We don't know how it began, but we do know what happened immediately afterwards. There are four main forces in the universe. We have um, um, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, we have gravity, and electromagnetism. Now, the electromagnetic spectrum uses the photon, the strong nuclear force is the gluon, and the W and Z bosons are for the weak nuclear force. But what is all of this? And the strong nuclear force is what keeps the photons within an atom together. You think about it, you've got two positive charges, why don't they repel? The strong nuclear force acts over very short distances to keep the nucleus of an atom together. A good demonstration of this is to use two, um, well, I couldn't find two yellow pages, but a BT film looking at yellow pages. I need two volunteers. Yes. <laughs> and somebody else ideally quite strong. Yeah. <coughs> now, the nuclear force, strong nuclear force, is very, very hard to overcome. You take just the edge of that there, you take just the edge of that there, in the middle, and pull, it shouldn't come apart. <laughs> <laughs> it did come apart. It's in fact very strong. In that <laughs> we tried. So yeah, they are stronger than the nuclear force. And we could have a look at that later, because there is a theory that will say why the strong nuclear force could in fact break down. The weak nuclear force is what allows atoms to decay by a beta decay. That's where a neutron turns into a proton. Um, and the other force is gravity. We don't know much about gravity at all. It's orders of magnitude weaker than every single other force in the universe. We think there could be a particle, which we call the graviton, but we really don't know. So the Big Bang happens at a single point. 
at this point, no matter will exist. We just have a lot and lot of energy which is incredibly dense and at an inf almost infinitely high temperature. Slowly, these forces, four forces that I've mentioned, will break down from the ground unified force. That's where everything was the same at the beginning. And then we started to get matter. To begin with, we made the quarks. Up, down, trans, strings, top, bottom. These are what you'll find within the proton. Everything along the top row has a charge of plus two thirds. Everything on the bottom, a charge of minus one third. So if you have up, up, down, two thirds plus two thirds minus a third, you'll get one. This is a proton. Likewise, you can have an up, down, down, plus two thirds minus one third minus one third, and you'll make the neutron. These are the bottom of electrons. That's where you get your electron. And then other forms of electron are the muon and the tau. In the beginning, these would have had so much energy they wouldn't have come together. But very, very slowly, you would have got, as it cooled down, the quarks would have come together to form your protons and neutrons. As it cooled further, you would have got down to your nucleus and the atom. At this point, nuclear fusion would take over, and the atoms of, um, so the nuclei of hydrogen, some would fuse to form helium, in a ratio of roughly 75 to 25 hydrogen to helium. For the next 160,000 years, it was still too hot for electrons to be captured by the nuclei, so we had ions. And then finally, about 360,000 years later, we got to what we'd call today the atom, where we have our nucleus and our electrons surrounding it. Other events that occurred are the hyperinflation of the universe. We don't really know what happened, but it got very, very big very, very quickly. So quick, it expanded faster than the speed of light at this point. We don't know why, and we don't know how. If you look at the whole thing, you'll see we're looking at matter. Well, antimatter also existed at the beginning of the universe, but somehow there was a shift. The matter and antimatter that was created at the same time annihilated. For some reason, though, we seem to have more matter left over at the end. That's what we're made of, but we don't know why we're made of matter, not antimatter, and even what causes imbalance. Slowly, over the next roughly circa 2 billion years, so again, it took quite a while. Gradually, gravity took over, and we can see here what we call the CMBR um, map. This is a cosmic microwave background radiation, and this is emitted from the Big Bang. The yellow points are hot, and the blue points are the colder points. Now on this, gravity was stronger in the blue points, that's where there's a greater amount of mass. Slowly, this mass has created stars, stars into galaxies, and galaxies into what we now call the universe. Now, why isn't everything uniform? If everything happened at the beginning, why are there changes? Why are there some points hotter and colder? We put this down to something called quantum tunneling. I've got a small video to show you on this. Suppose you drop a ball down the side of the valley. Classical wisdom tells us that when the ball rolls up the hill on the other side, it can't go any higher than the height from which you dropped it. That's conservation of energy. Even if there's a nice big long slope to roll down on the far side of the mountain, the ball just can't get there, unless you give it enough energy to get over the barrier. But in quantum mechanics, things work a little differently. You see, the quantum world is probabilistic, so if you release a particle in a valley, chances are the next time you see it, it'll still be somewhere in that valley. But if there's a nice big slope to roll down on the far side of the mountain, well, that's a place the particle would really like to be. And it turns out, there's also a small chance that's where you'll find it. If this isn't crazy enough, it's even possible you'll find the particle in the middle of the mountain. And in real life, this means that an electron sometimes hangs around inside the nucleus of an atom. We think it's these small quantum fluctuations. that allow the universe to become what it is today, where gravity, for some reason, ends up stronger and weaker at certain points. And this leads to what we now see today in the universe, where gravity is strong in certain parts, hence why we have galaxies, uh, superclusters, and why every star isn't an equal distance apart. And that is pretty much what happened to get to where we are today. So, today, what is it? Well, we'll look at the large-scale structure of the universe. As I'm sure most of you are aware, we have stars, which organize themselves, in our case, into a local group of maybe 10 to 12 stars, and gradually we build up and up until we get to the galaxy. Now, we live in the Milky Way galaxy. 
you see here, we start with the Earth's solar system, and I said the neighborhood in the Milky Way galaxy. Now, this is one of the largest structures comparative to us that we can kind of visualize quite easily, but we can go even bigger. So the local galactic group is made up of a number of galaxies, such as the Andromeda, and various of the unnamed galaxies, um, that are all within our, what we call, neighborhood. Now, in real terms, this could be hundreds of light years across, hundreds of millions of light years across in some places. <coughs> and again, these galactic groups on this are every dot you can see. Lots and lots of clusters of galaxies where galaxies have formed. Gravity is strong in one place, and all of this keeps it um, together. We go again to the local superclusters. We are on an enormous scale now, billions of light years across. And finally, into what we call the observable universe, which is huge. This is called the cosmic work. We think at one point it started a bit like this, but as you can see, gravity is slowly taking over, and you can see where it's becoming stronger in places. You'll see voids here where matter just doesn't exist, and you'll see other places called filaments where gravity is concentrated. This is where we get large groups of superclusters, of clusters of galaxies, each containing a large amount of stars. This is another picture here. You can see here voids where we can't see any superclusters of galaxies. And here we have what's called the Great Slow Wall. And this is just, again, a very large group. This one's a name down the bottom. Now, the universe, we think, could even have a shape. Now, how can we really explain this? It's incredibly hard to tell how space itself can be curved in on itself. Well, we think we have a couple of theories. The first and obvious one is that the universe and space-time itself is flat, i.e. if I carried on walking through the universe, I would never get back to where I began. Other theories suggest that I could start here and walk in a straight line, but still get back to where I started from. A good way to visualize this is my two little ants on a balloon, so I have a balloon. If I started walking from a point, whilst it would appear that I keep on walking straight, I would actually get back to the same point in the universe. Now, we don't know how this can happen, whether it can happen, we're not entirely sure how we can prove it. But this would mean that we can try and model how the universe could end due to how space is looped in on itself. It's not easy to visualise because we, don't, we only live in three dimensions. And this would kind of suggest that there's something else another dimension of space-time that's kind of folding in on itself. Another one is the whole star shape, and the fact that if you go around, you'll be on a curvature, but you'll never get back to where you began. Again, different theories of how the universe can be of different shapes. Now, the universe is very, very big, and something that a lot of people uh, find hard to understand, but I don't completely understand it, is how the diameter and the radius of the observable universe can be greater than the age of the universe. We just said that light can travel extremely fast, because we see it everywhere, but we still have a boundary to what we can see. Now, the universe has been around for approximately 13.7 billion years. However, the radius in light years is greater than 13.7 billion light years. <coughs> it's roughly 46. So what does this mean? Well, it means that the universe is expanding we're expanding so much that it's possible that points very far away from us are expanding that way. Relative, we're going that way. And our expansions can mean that we're actually expanding at a rate faster than the speed of light. Now, in the future, this could mean that our universe begins to diminish faster and faster because what we see is light. And the light isn't able to get to us because the space itself is expanding. Now, it's not we're special, everything's expanding away from us. Everything expanding away from each other. The balloon again, if you watch any dots, they're all moving away from each other. So, and as we let that, they all condense again. What does this mean? Well, we think there's something else out there that's causing the universe to expand faster and faster, but we're not entirely sure what it is. It could be part of the vacuum of space. It's also something we could put down to dark energy. Whatever it is, it's an extremely powerful force. <coughs> so what's in the universe? So we'll have a quick look at some of the interesting phenomena that we actually find. A popular one are black holes. But what are black holes? 
Well, the points of space where something happens, and if you keep on falling, you will always fall until you get to a singularity. Now, for the majority, they're formed by exploding stars. Because there's so much mass concentrated in the stars to explode, it then implodes upon itself into a singularity, where everything falls in and not even light can escape. This area here is what we see as a black hole. From this point, this part of what we look at appears to be black and nothing can escape from it. Now, if you look at a black hole, you see sometimes bits around it called gravitational lensing. The light itself has been bent as it gets passed around the black hole. If you pass through the event of that and you can't escape, that's why it appears to be black. The gravitational pull at this point is so strong that not even light can escape. Now, this raises an interesting point. Light has no mass, so how can it be bent? But we know light has energy, yet if it doesn't have mass, how can it have energy? It turns out this isn't actually the complete equation to E equals mc squared. The full equation is E squared equals mc squared squared plus pc, all squared. Now this looks a little complicated, we can actually show it using a right angle triangle. The hypotenuse will be our energy. One side will be mc squared, one side will be pc. What do all these things mean? m is your mass, c squared is the, speed, is the square of the speed of light, and p is your momentum. Now energy has no mass. So we can then remove this side, and we get E on one side, and PC on the other. So that's how much energy the um, speed of sorry, light has. It's its momentum times the speed of light. Now, this is great, but it still doesn't um, show us why gravity will interfere with it. That's because gravity doesn't attract mass. It attracts energy and momentum. That's why we can see the, what we call gravitational lensing effect in this photo, and how light can be bent. Likewise, if I'm standing still, I have a mass, which means that I can, again, remove the PC side, because I have no momentum, to make E equals MC squared. What does this mean? Well, this means when I'm standing still, I still have energy. And so I start to move, I'll obey this equation here, because I have more energy when I'm moving than I do when I'm standing still. This explains how we can bend light, the effect of gravitational lensing. In extreme circumstances, if we have a star directly behind, the light can be bent in such a way that we actually see the star behind it. But an effect of this is also that the, we can actually see the star twice. The light has been bent around, and we see it twice from our observing points back on Earth. Now, once you get past this point, there is no escape. And if a singularity, we think everything is compressed down to an infinitesimally small point. What happens after that, we don't know, because we can never send any information back out to the black hole. And eventually, you'll die if you go to a black hole, and there is no escape. It will eventually catch up with you. If we look now back at the CMBR radiation, well, okay, these really dark blue bits, they actually give us a clue to what super massive black holes are. A normal black hole might be on the order of 30 solar masses, so that's 30 times the mass of our sun. But then we find black holes with billions of times the mass of our sun. Nothing in the middle, <coughs> only these two extremes. And this size could be maybe from the, the size of Jupiter's orbit, which is massive. So how do these forms so big? We think in the early universe, these areas of very high and um, very dense amounts of gravity start to pull everything in on itself and cause these supermassive black holes to form. And bound which, on the a disk, this is where we think we get galaxies forming. Again, we can't tell, because obviously the light gets trapped back inside the black hole, and then it, um, we can't actually see it after that. So dark matter is the next thing we'll look at. What is dark matter? Well, we're not entirely sure, but we can make a couple of guesses. 
When we look at the universe, we see that, well, actually, most of it isn't normal matter at all, like what you mean, stars are made of. And some of it is made of this dark matter, this elusive particle. We're not entirely sure what it is, but it does have some interesting effects. One that it has is the rotation of a galaxy. So that's my galaxy. When we look at the speed of the rotation of a galaxy at all points across its radius, we find it spins much, much faster than it should do due to the momentum it has and the amount of mass it has. Why? Well, something's speeding it up. We think it's this dark matter. We can't see it, we can't detect it, but we know it's acting. This explains why the universe could be expanding as well, but this could also be down to dark energy. Now, dark energy is a force that seems to be pushing outwards on the universe, and what's causing this expansion? Turns out the expansion is happening faster and faster and faster, to a point where it could break the speed of light. Why? We think it's dark energy. The dark energy allows the universe to expand in every direction, so space itself is expanding. Everything's getting further apart from everything else relative to it. Acting inwards is the dark matter, but after a while it becomes very, very weak. So this would explain why galaxies can spin around fast, but why the universe is expanding faster and faster. And this is what I was just saying here. We calculated back a while ago that the distance from the centre against the velocity should be pretty much like that. As you get further and further away, momentum will decrease. But we seem to be out of the amount of matter. This is what was actually measured. So we think there must be the matter there, because we've got missing matter otherwise. So we call this dark matter. And there's a couple of interesting phenomena. These are just other little ideas that come across that we find in the universe that, again, can be shown in a handy video. Imagine learning for the first 18 years of your life that the Earth is flat. All through elementary school and high school, you grow up hearing about the flat Earth we on and doing boring flat Earth physics and work. And then, if you're lucky enough, you get to college and psych, for the first time they show you a globe and say, sorry for lying, the Earth is actually round. Well, this is, unfortunately, exactly what we do with... You probably learned that objects attract each other based on their mass. So you probably grew up thinking that light can't possibly be affected by gravity because light is massless. I know I did. Well, guess what? The source of gravity is not mass. It's energy and momentum, which light certainly has. Of course, regular matter does, too. So not only does light get bent past by a star or planet or black hole, but light attracts the planet or star or black hole in return. To be sure, it's only a very, very small amount, but a small amount is not zero. Anyway, the point is that Newton's law of gravitation is just an approximation. Good enough to get us to the moon, but not perfect. General relativity is bent. Speaking of the moon, you probably also learned that if a sheep is moving two miles per hour relative to a train, and that train is moving two miles per hour in the same direction relative to the ground, then the sheep is moving four miles per hour relative to the ground. Two miles per hour plus two miles per hour equals four miles per hour, right? False. Experiments in special relativity have confirmed that velocities don't simply act together, and so the sheep will in fact be moving very, very ever so slightly slower than four miles per hour relative to the ground. And the formula that correctly predicts this deviation from just adding the velocities is v1 plus v2 divided by 1 plus v1 times v2 over c squared. It's not a very big effect, but then again, the Earth looks pretty flat, doesn't it? But the Earth isn't flat. If I walk 10,000 kilometers away from my cat, and you continue on walking 10,000 kilometers more, you're not 20,000 kilometers away from my cat. You're just 12,750 kilometers away. In fact, the farthest on Earth you can get from anything on Earth is 12,750 kilometers. It's the earthly distance limit, though we normally call it the diameter of the Earth. And similarly, when you try to add two velocities together, there's a cosmic speed limit of 300 million meters per second. That is, the speed of light. So just because to our eyes the Earth looks flat, velocity doesn't look like they simply add together, and light looks like it doesn't attract gravitation, is that an excuse to mislead ourselves and our children about the true nature of things? Next thing we're going to look at is, because I can't remember, the end of the universe. So what's going to happen in the end? Again, we've got a number of two theories that all compete with each other. We do have a favourable one, and that's the big freeze. It's not so much everything turning to ice, but it's more everything loses so much energy, it 
there is no energy transfer in the universe. As the universe expands faster and faster, energy can't be transferred anymore. Every particle will therefore lose their energy into space, and the space will then absorb the energy. What does this mean? It means that it, gradually everything will be pulled apart, and you'll have just single atoms on their own. The next one is the Big Rip. It's a similar idea, but again, this is why I set up the strong nuclear force that holds the atoms together. The idea with the Big Rip is that the universe expands so, so fast that these actually get pulled apart. And matter is literally annihilated with each other. And the other idea is the Big Crunch and the Big Bounce. Now this one we don't believe so much. We did it ten years ago, but we have a new equation to help us. Um, the big crunch suggests that gravity will start to come back in on itself and the universe will all get pointed down into a, another singularity. Now this then comes back to the big bounce. Well, the big bounce here, it says, once this happens, it will then bounce out and the universe starts again. So could the universe therefore have, could there have been one before ours? Will there be one after ours? Could it be that it's actually been around forever and this isn't going to happen and there won't be an end to the universe? Well, we think there will be an end to the universe, but it could be in quite a while. So, observing the universe. It's not easy to observe the universe when it's so big, but we can have a good go. Now, what do we see? You may see a lot of pictures such as this, but really these are just computer generated. What we won't see, we won't see it anywhere near that much detail, neither in that much beauty. We see things more like this. Now, in this picture, every dot of light is a galaxy. This is from the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And again, you can, you can just see the gravitational lensing effect with the bits of light. You may be able to find galaxies in there actually appear twice. It's kind of hard to spot when they're all seemingly the same colour. You also get other images that you might see as being graphically enhanced if everything appears in nice, pretty colours. In reality, it will only ever take on the colour from the light that gets absorbed by it and is then re-emitted. So an absorbent spectrum. And how do we see it? Well, this is the next European plan telescope. This is called the Very Large Telescope. Um, there was another telescope plan to construction between 2017 and 2019 called the Overwhelmingly Large Telescope which then would be abbreviated down to OWL. However, this had to be abandoned because it was deemed too expensive with a 100 metre wide telescope. Instead, we use this. Now, what does this allow us to do? It allows us to look at the stars. We collect as much light as we can and we have a very, very large detail in our images then. Hence why large telescopes allow us to get more detail in our images. Of course, the better place is in space. This is the James Webb Telescope that's going to be sent off within the next 10 years, hopefully. An interesting point to make, does anybody know what the plates are made of that make up the James Webb Telescope? It's the second lightest metal, if that helps anyone. It's actually beryllium. Now, I can't think of another use for beryllium off the top of my head. So we finally found a use for beryllium. Why are we using it? It's so, so light, but also really reflected. Light coming in can then be reflected at a larger mass <coughs> into here, where it's then be reflected into the middle. And as it keeps on bouncing backwards and forwards, we then get it all down onto a sensor. It's all then condensed, computerized, and we get a lot of information within our image design. And this is a new interesting one. I take it everybody's up to date with the Tesco burger fiasco from yesterday. Sometimes when we look into space, we find things that don't entirely make sense, or we can't work out what they mean. Turns out that when we looked at a galaxy not too long, and um, we found this dust cloud. And within this dust cloud, we found a particular, um, found a particular compound. It's what gives raspberries a taste of raspberries. So I have some raspberries for you to eat. You pass them around, you can now taste space. Um, it also smells of rum, but we couldn't get rum in because the teachers would tell us off. Um, why and how do these compounds form? We're not entirely sure, but they do. Could it be that perhaps the actions are occurring within the vacuum of space? Would it even taste like glass of in space? Again, we don't know. However, when we observe things like this, they do catch the attention of the popular press. We see a lot of people don't like glass please, neither do I. And then extraterrestrial life. And you see this again in a lot of sci-fi fantasy. 
If somebody actually tried to create an equation, they would actually explain um, what the probability is of us actually finding life. It's called the Drake equation. And this, coming out of it, is the number of civilizations which we think we might communicate. So this takes an average rate of star formation times by a fraction of stars with planets, by planets that can support life, by the fraction that they want to support life, intelligent life, the developed technology detectable from space, and then the length of time that they will take to release such. Will this ever happen? Will we ever find extraterrestrial life? Again, it's something we can't predict. Would they be humanoid? Well, it could be that they are, such as David Tennant at the time was, but it's also plausible that they could be based around a human, but perhaps be bipedal, but not be human themselves. We could find that there's interstellar space travel. We could find um, large ships that can maybe travel faster than the speed of light. But again, this technology is beyond us. Neither do we know how to create it to actually get to these such far places. Perhaps it doesn't look like anything that we'd ever seen before. Perhaps it's silicon based. Or perhaps it's a machine. It could well be the machines end up ruling this planet somehow. Again, we don't particularly know. So what have we found out? Well, we found out there's a lot we don't know about space, but there's also a lot we can kind of have a good guess to work out. So, like I said, the universe is really, really big, and there's a lot we don't know. Um, so thanks for the talk. Um, any questions? Um, I'm happy to... Yeah, go for it. I, I, I apologise, I, I might have missed this, because I've been out, but uh, yeah. in sort of terms of the Big Bang Theory, what's your opinion on time and that sort of thing? Cause time. In some way, people believe that there was sort of no time, the beginning and a time. Came yeah. to appear as like the other forces, so would you count that as one of the forces that comes into account? Well, when we look at space, we think of space time. That's three dimensions, and there's also time running alongside all of this. What we think is, in fact, when the universe began, time was the same relative. The way in which you measure time is arbitrary, we use seconds. Um, we think it just did progress gradually over 360,000 years. Um, a lot of the action happened within the first 20 minutes of the universe, even more so within about 1, to the, one times 10 to the minus 10 of that second. Um, so we think time progressed normally, but again, we're not entirely sure because we can't actually go back. The only clues we see are from the CMBR radiation. Um, any other questions? Good. Thank you very much.